The Greatest Gift by David Kerr The sun burned. It stared down at the land and vengefully shone upon them. It hated that world below. It had nourished life once. Now it sought to bleed every wretched soul dry. The wind whipped up dust and grit, scooping it up from the dead and lifeless ground, hurling it viciously at Cooper. The lenses of his goggles were milky and scratched, and the air felt weighty behind his mask. The compass said he was on the right path. It wouldn't be long now. Just carry on. Don't let the heat stop you. Don't let the tiredness claim you. One foot in front of the other. He could do this. He could. Things had reached this point all too easily, playing out like every cynical estimation of the content of the human soul. Some had pulled together. Most had rushed to slit each other's throats. Even with all the warnings, even with all the calls for calm, anarchy had been unleashed. Everyone was expecting the worst, and all too eagerly showed the worst inside of themselves. He'd watched it. He'd stood in his garden and watched it. Stood there, peering into the telescope, he'd followed it as it had come roaring towards Earth, burning through the skies. It had looked so beautiful, hadn't it? He'd always looked to the skies and dreamt. Now he watched in a casual resignation. It wasn't a vista of hope anymore. It crushed his spirit. Cooper pushed down the thoughts. He didn't want to remember the anarchy, nor the way everything had torn itself apart. He felt himself choke as he thought of the family he'd left. We're too weak. You have to go without us. He had wept in agony for his mother and his brother. So little water, but he cried day after day walking the roads in search of any friends he might seek somewhere better with. A tear wanted to free itself. His eyes were so dry. They clicked as he blinked. He kept walking. I didn't know you believed, Mary said the first time she saw him hold the cross around his neck. He'd been praying for another week of surviving. Now he prayed to reach the end of every day. Faith had always been a private endeavour for him and discussed it with some reluctance. It was for each person to decide. It had kept him sane. He gasped as he thought of his tearful mother placing the cross around his neck as she wept, her frail hands shaking uncontrollably as the storms began chewing up their town. Back to the moment. Keep walking. Feel the heat. Hear the sounds. Stay alert. Focus. Passing the burnt husk of the bin wagon, he knew he was almost there. Would he call it home? He was actually scared to call it home, but they had put down roots here. It was hardly palatial, it was barely even habitable, but it was there. It was a home. They kept it mostly buried under the sand. They'd built it low, inconspicuous. They'd done everything to avoid drawing any attention. Avoiding trouble was always better than having to deal with it when it decided to slap you in the face. Cooper found the buried rope in the sand and pulled it, revealing the entrance. He knocked the code on the frame, two short knocks and three long. Walking in, he closed the door behind him, hearing the sand slide back into place, concealing the home once more. With a grunt, he lowered the rucksack to the floor and pulled the mask free of his face. Relief flooded him, and he collapsed into the armchair. Dust plumed from its fabric, but he didn't mind. Mary sat, reading by dim candlelight, the scant shafts of light leaking in through their water bottle windows not enough. Jim. Her brother was curled on the floor next to her, a blanket draped over his small form, a wheezy snore emanating from his congested sinuses. Mary looked up at Cooper and saw the fatigue on his face, barely concealed by his thick, dark beard. Any luck? Mary suppressed her desperation and hid it with a casual tone. Cooper could tell something was wrong, but he just didn't have enough energy to delve into it. He'd been gone for three days but it felt so much longer. Some, he mumbled, enough. He pulled the goggles free from his face, for now. Water, she croaked, a little. He seemed to sink further into the chair. We have what we need. A lie. Mary could probably tell that it was a lie, but she stayed silent. It hadn't rained in weeks, and the collectors he'd stationed in the hills had nothing. He found two bottles left in the boot of an abandoned car. After three days, that was all the water he'd found. His hands gripped the arms of the chair until his knuckles went white. He wanted it to just envelop him, wrap him up 
and consume him. I was Jim. Each word was an unbelievable effort, his throat and tongue edged closer to rebellion. A little better, the infection seems to be clearing. Some good news at last. For a whole fortnight, he'd just been getting worse and worse. The thought of him improving lightened Cooper's soul. He looked at Mary and smiled as best he could. His friend looked back at him and with a small smile spread across her face. A thin, stiff upper lip raised a little in the corner like it always did when she smiled. Three days without that. How had he survived? Rest, Coop. Rest. He hadn't realised his eyes were closing. They weighed so much. He couldn't fight it. Please, he thought. Don't let me dream of them. And he didn't. All he found in sleep was a yawning black void. Mary pulled a blanket over him and then silently wept in relief. Hours slipped away. Cooper floated in that dark pool, immersed in blissful silence. As he slept, Jim had awoken, excited to see that Cooper had returned. Mary had to calm him down so as not to wake their friend. Jim didn't completely understand much of anything that was going on, but he loved and trusted his sister, and he loved and trusted Cooper. He put all his faith in them, even if they did sometimes lie, he chose not to notice. Part of him knew it was their best way to protect him. Mary was determined to protect him. She promised her father. Being a half-brother didn't mean a damn to her. She'd loved the boy since the day she first met him. She felt that pull on her heart again, thinking of her father, too ill to even walk a single street, collapsing, waiting for the sand to claim him. She'd stopped Jim from turning around. After all, he'd suffered enough when his mother had disappeared. Mary kept lying. Of course we'd find Jessica. I'm sure your mum's fine. Lies. Lies he needed for now. Dinner that night had been a mystery. Sometimes Cooper would just gloss over what was in there. Better that way. It was edible and that was all that mattered. No matter how god-awful it tasted, Jim never complained. Mary occasionally winced, but she was thankful too. When it was her turn to cook, things typically came out a little better. She was a bit more ambitious about what could be achieved. Although, that night, she and Cooper had decided that they really missed bacon. Such a simple thing. It had now become so complex, so distant. In the early evening, the storms died down. No longer hearing the constant howl was euphoric to them all. Can I go outside? Jim asked, bouncing up and down. Mary and Cooper conferred silently with a range of facial expressions, then a unanimous shrug. Jim had been thrilled. Cooper wound his watch. Ten minutes and not a moment more, okay? He sounded distant, his thoughts drifting elsewhere. He slung his bow across his body and took several arrows into his quiver. Mary took the butcher's knife into her belt and they headed outside. Jim had barely seen the outside in a fortnight and was elated. He ran through the sand, rolled in it, kicked his football along in it. He didn't laugh or yell. He knew the rules. No shouting, no drawing attention. Be subtle, be silent as you can. Only speak when close, use signals at distance. Avoid trouble. Always avoid trouble. Cooper wanted to keep the boy inside, though, to let him rest some more and clear the infection from his body. The moment Jim stepped beyond the threshold of the home, his anxiety struck him brutally, but the boy had lost enough already. There was only so much he could deprive him of, for life just became an extension of your days and nothing more. He didn't want to inflict that on someone else. Sometimes he just had to take the risk. Seeing Jim smile and merrily wave to him, he knew it was a risk worth taking. For a little while, he didn't feel like such a failure. As time went on and the light waned, they all retreated back to the relative safety of the shelter and huddled together on the mattress, an array of blankets on top of them. Cooper was still fighting to have focus inside his mind. It was the exhaustion, he told himself. Just the exhaustion. He closed his eyes and drifted into sleep, with Jim holding on tight to him. Mary, however could not find the peace of that sleepy oblivion. Instead, she found herself looking at the lines on Cooper's face, the tanned and wet skin across his forehead and cheeks, the dried and cracked lips that were slightly parted as he slept. She looked at him and tried to understand what was inside of herself. 
She knew she'd been feeling something, especially when Cooper was away. But she couldn't make sense of it all. Why did her heart bother her so much, when she had long been aware of the fact that, without question, each tomorrow could be their last? A single tear was all she had left within her. It trickled from her eye and ran along the length of her nose. The sensation was almost alien now, as she'd become numb to so much. She didn't want to admit it to herself, but, as she thought of the single droplet upon her face, it almost felt good. As Jim and Cooper slept, she sat in the dark, looking for an answer. Cooper's eyes shot wide open. The voice was close by his ear, and it insistently whispered his name. He was thankful to be pulled from painful dreams. His eyes quickly adjusted to the half-light to see Mary before him, her nose wrinkled slightly in a mischievous expression. A hair draped down over one shoulder. Follow me, she whispered, before slipping out of the compact room. Jim was soundly asleep, clutching at his sister's blankets. Cooper quickly checked his forehead. The fever had well and truly been banished. His kid was strong, and he couldn't help but feel a little bit of pride at that. He made sure the boy was well covered, and then followed Mary, whom he found near the exit. She beckoned him outside, and they stepped cautiously out into the early morning sun. Mary grasped Cooper's hand, a thing she so rarely did, and led him to the side of their concealed home. She'd been busy. She had made a new addition. Using some old plastic panels, she had made a very small and very low shelter, a small outcropping propped up with two old broom handles. He knew they couldn't leave it up. It would draw attention. But in that second, seeing how deeply satisfied Mary was, it made him appreciate it and admire the work she had done. I decided to build it this morning, she said softly, grinning at Cooper. What gave you the urge? he whispered in reply. Not sure, she answered. Just couldn't sleep. Watch your head, though. It's more your height. Mary looked at the evident height difference between them both. You are far too fond of mocking my height. She squeezed his hand. The pair took themselves beneath the low awning and looked out across the hills, covered like most things, in sand. Sat beside one another. Not a word was said at first. They just kept looking out. Both were thinking how to start. Cooper decided he'd begin, but then Mary cut across him. I almost forgot. She dug into the sand beside her and reached down to her shoulder, fishing about for something. Just one second. Cooper watched on in curiosity. Here we go. Mary announced as a hand emerged, brandishing half a bottle of Johnny Walker. How do you? I've been saving it. I think we might as well have it now. There was a tinge of sadness as she tailed off. Cooper just nodded and unscrewed the cap. They began taking sips in silence. Both of them were keen to talk, but those opening words seemed evasive. What was so hard about talking? It had been something both of them had always been good at. It's my turn to inspect the rain collectors, isn't it? Mary said out of nowhere. Cooper stifled a laugh. I think you need rain before that's needed. But I could just go for those beautiful views. She gestured to the monotonous scenery with the bottle. It's very invigorating. But I thought we were headed to the beach today, dear. They both clasped each other's mouths as they let out a short burst of laughter. Mary sighed a contented sigh. I'm glad, she said. Though we're not talking the serious talks for once. Cooper nodded. All of that just seems to swallow up all of life, even the good things. She took another swig from the bottle and then passed it over. He stared at the mouth of it. Yeah, I know what you mean. His smile was scored with lines of lament. He quickly sipped from the bottle. At least we have some good things to enjoy right now. Jim's a lot better. We've not had trouble in a while. We have food and something nice. He shook the bottle to drink. Indeed we do. She snatched the bottle from Cooper and grinned. I knew little people were sneaky. She punched him soundly in the leg. That! He gasped through a quiet, wheezy laugh. It was uncalled for. Not from where I'm sitting. She gulped down some more of the whiskey. Is the perspective really that different two feet lower down? He earned himself another punch. Aren't you fearful of retaliation? He asked, rubbing his numb leg. Oh, come on. You know, you'd never hit a lady. She moved closer and smirked at him. True, but the question remains, why aren't 
you fearful of retaliation. He felt a very broad and genuine smile spread on his lips that he couldn't quite understand, but it was there. Mary went to punch him again, and he grabbed her wrist, and his hand slid further until they were holding hands. She turned her body to better look at him, and they sat there, letting time pass, waiting as the sun began to slowly rise. Cooper cleared his throat and squeezed the hand tightly. I guess I should be honest with you. She pressed her other finger to his lips to silence him. Just let me enjoy this moment before you say what you need to. I have hope. And what did you say? It's the greatest gift of all. They kept looking at one another. Everything else wasn't existing for them. They both could have unbridled hope, seeing it blossom in each other. They didn't need to say anything. Sometimes words just got in the way. The sun ascended, cruelty absent from its glare. It welcomed the clouds to unburden themselves upon the land. Its light shone through as the rain began to fall, colours proudly streaking through the sky.